Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, rock on. Here we are. Hi, Varun. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Uh, just would have been happier if it was not not that cold. Today is an unusually cold day. And not for Boston, but I think coming out from warmer days to cold, you know, it doesn't make me happy. This so. is true. <laughs> we did have a little slew of of warm weather leading up to this I particular know. day. So I thought if spring is here, we are right there, but no, we had to get another snowfall. So and it's chilly morning. So anyway. Who do Speaking we have today? Here, yes, here we go. So today's guest is a member of the Ford's Technology Council. He's a board member at the Entrepreneurship Institute. Uh, he was named one of the fastest growing firms in the Midwest in 2020. His firm was also named uh, number 481 in Inc. Magazine's list of the 500 fastest growing companies. You've been listed twice, if I'm not mistaken, in Inc. Um, you were also included in Crane's list of notable LGBTQ executives in the Chicago land area. You, you guys, this is a long list and it's kind of awesome. There's a couple more doozies on here. So you're listed in Crane Chicago Magazine Tech 50. You're the winner of the Design Value Award from the Design Management Institute for the work in the Department of Defense. He is founder and CEO of Tandem, JC Grubbs. Welcome to the podcast, JC. Thank you. <laughs> it's Thank an impressive you. list there, my friend. You guys have been busy over there. <laughs> busy is always good. It is true. So let's dive in. So our first question is always, what uh, myth busting? So what kind of myth or bogus strategy or misconception would you like to set the record straight on? And we might have a couple. For those of you listening, we've, we've got a couple queued up here. So you pick which one you want to tackle first. All right. Um, let's go with um, sales is overrated and marketing is underrated. Let's start I there. Mean, I can't argue with that. I, my sales friends would probably disagree with me, but my background is marketing. So there you go. All right. Tell us, tell us what's, what are we, what are we busting here? Yeah. I mean, I think for companies like Tandem and firms that are in the services space, Sales isn't really a thing, at least in my opinion. Um, you know, doing cold emails, doing cold calling generally doesn't, at least for our business, really doesn't provide the opportunity flow that we need. Um, for us, the marketing channel is much more valuable. Um, it gets our name out there. It gets our people out there, um, our expertise out there. And there's lots of ways that we do that. Um, and so for us, sales really doesn't exist. It's really an opportunity comes in and we kind of shepherd it through our, our process for validating the qualification of an opportunity. Um, and that really involves getting a lot of our experts in front of a customer as early as possible. So once we have a lead that comes in through a marketing channel, um, either myself or uh, my COO will do a quick, very quick qualification call, um, usually less than half an hour, which is just really to, de to determine like, is there an actual project here? Do they have some budget to spend? Does it fit within the kind of work that we do? Um, and if so, it immediately goes into um, a client partner who really is shepherding it more as an, as a, an actual project at that point and less about closing a deal. Um, so we'll spend, you know, two or three meetings going through um, conversations with the client to understand, you know, what their technical needs are, what their business objectives are, helping our team understand, you know, the team that we're going to be interfacing with on the client side, understanding their personalities, their communication styles, et cetera. Um, and then really moving into um, either a very brief proposal, uh, because at that point, we've had enough conversations that we've really described, here's how we can solve the problem that you've brought to us. 
Um, so proposal and, and, you know, contracting, and then we're done. Um, so we really don't sell. Um, we just put problem solvers in front of a client that need, has a need and things kind of naturally flow from there. So, so what, what you yeah, described is, um, uh, you know, I think an ideal situation, you know, as ideal scenario, which everybody would want to strive for. Has this always been the case with your company? You've been around for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So when you started out, I mean, or let me ask you this way, like, you know, is this always, it, has this always been the case or is that, has, has this model changed over recent times? I think we've refined this model, but we've really never done any what I would call traditional sales activities. Um, <clears throat> the the places where we kind of veer into sales maybe a little bit is when we know we're in a scenario where we're bidding against multiple other firms. But quite honestly, that's a little bit of a red flag for us. Um, if a client is looking at five, 10 different companies um, or we're going through an RFP process, generally, we kind of shy away from those things. Um, usually it means the client has already picked who they want or they're looking for some free consulting advice, even though that might be subconscious. They're looking to explore a problem with multiple vendors. Um, and more often than not, we, we choose to compete against, um, <laughs> this is going to sound odd, but we choose to compete against the client as opposed to competing against a competitor. And what I mean by that is we're, we're choosing to compete against the client's understanding of how we would solve their problem. And that's the challenge for us in the process of closing a deal, as opposed to choosing to say, we're going to throw our hat in the ring with five or six other firms. Um, that generally doesn't, doesn't work for us. Um, sometimes we will win those, those deals and that's great, but they're, they're harder on our team um, because they require a lot more kind of upfront documentation, as well as often those processes are a little bit in a vacuum. <clears throat> so the, the, the opportunities that we tend to pursue are ones where the client wants to engage with us really deeply very early, as opposed to what happens with a typical RFP process is you get a document that kind of outlines what they want, but not really. And then you get some information from like a Q and A session, but you're really kind of shooting in the dark. And those are signals to us that even if we won that opportunity, the client probably isn't gonna be the right customer for us because they're not really engaged in wanting to work in a co-creative way. They're engaged in a buying process, which is not what we, are interested in. We're not interested in selling you something. We're interested in helping solve a problem. So I totally agree with the thought process and the idea, you know, this is the approach we want to, to take, like consultative selling. Basically, it is, you know, you're consulting the client at that point. But my concern, not the concern, but I think the challenge that I know many companies feel is, um, how in, in that environment, how do you rely? I mean, how do you generate the leads in the first place then? Like if you're not doing sales, like if your marketing is doing a great job, then yes, sure. Like this is a model that we all want, but not everybody has that kind of, you know, um, liberty to have the inflow of leads that are coming in and you can just keep talking to, the, to those prospects. Uh, in that scenario, how, like I'm sure, in 10 years, you must have seen those patches where there are no leads. <laughs> then what do you do? Like, you know, how do you yeah. manage the inflow of business? Yeah, there's kind of two things there. Um, you know, early on and even still today, like we're very, we've got a pretty big network, um, both in Chicago and now kind of in San Francisco and some other places that we've done business. And so, you know, while we don't go out to that network and actively sell, we definitely keep close ties with people. Um, so we we spend you know a fair amount of time. We, I mean, those of us who are in the kind of front end of the funnel process, right? 
you know, we spend a fair amount of time, you know, just checking in, like there's probably a hundred or so people that I go through over the course of a year just to say, Hey, how's it going? How's your business? You know, um, what's new in your world? Um, certainly when we see people on our network that are changing jobs or moving to a new company, you know, we'll reach out and just kind of continue the awareness that we're here and this is what we do. Um, you know, as our service offerings have kind of grown and evolved over time, you know, sometimes we'll shoot a little message out to somebody to just say, hey, I know you had a design need a couple of years ago and we didn't really have much of a mature design team. We do now, just letting you know, um, you know, how are things going? So it's not really a sale. It's more of a keeping a lot of people warm. So that's one thing. The other thing that we do when we do get into those patches where, you know, we don't have um, quite the deal flow that we'd like, or we've got a lot of deal flow that we just don't want to take because it's not right for us as a company. Um, we have cultivated a pretty strong network of other companies like Tandem. So we've got, um, I'd say probably about a dozen companies that I'm in close contact with. We've got a Slack channel, um, you know, really almost every week um, sharing needs and leads, right? So company X has extra capacity, company Y has, you know, over lots more clients than they can take. And we kind of collectively will, will share subcontracting to kind of fill in the gaps, um, which is how we think about it. It's not the core part of our business, but it's a way for us to maintain, you know, high utilization when we do have, you know, folks on the beach. So it's, uh, I would say, nurturing in a many senses of the word in terms of nurturing that funnel of folks coming in from the top, nurturing those who already exist. And how are you, you know, what are some of the marketing tactics that you guys have found? I think this is an area that that some agencies struggle with is how do you dump people in that top of the funnel? What are, what are you finding that has been successful outside of the one-to-one the -one networking? Do you guys do like yeah. a monthly newsletter or some sort of other activities? I mean, Content is obviously a huge thing. Content, though, I think evolves over time in terms of what it, what, um, you know, it's not just a blog anymore. Um, it, it, it can't be. You've got to have some extra spin on it. And you have to also, and, and I'm a little bit out of my depth here because I would really want to defer to our marketing director to kind of weigh in on this. But we definitely think a lot about like, the target audience of content and the format for it. So over the years, if we're targeting, um, if, we're, if we're targeting a hiring channel, right? Like, you know, we need these four positions filled. You know, we'll have our team kind of do roundtables, day in the life kind of things. Um, you know, content that's very um, focused on culture and um, values and things like that. On the on the on the client side, you know, it's content that is leveraging case studies. It's content that's leveraging, um, you know, past experiences with specific technologies, um, et cetera. And then funneling that that content to you know different marketing channels, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever the social media things are out there. But really thinking about how those um, campaigns are created, funneling the right content to the right people. Um, and for us, you know, we don't need a thousand leads a year, right? Like we need 15 really high quality leads a year. Um, our projects tend to be no shorter than four or five months, and they can range up to multiple years. Um, and our teams are, you know, minimum kind of three people, maximum 10 or 15 people. Um, and so they're really large, chunky, expensive projects for clients. And so for us, it's really about the extreme targeting as opposed to casting a really wide net and just seeing what, what falls in. Um, and so I think that's kind of the, the broad strokes of it. Um, again, I would love for Carson to be here to give more details on exactly her thinking about this. Um, but, you know, sh 
we've been pretty thoughtful about it. Um, uh, she and her team give a monthly analytics report to the leadership team at Tandem that's really, really detailed. And we tend to make decisions based on, okay, let's pause this campaign. Let's maybe we lean a little heavier here. Um, some of it's dependent on who we know, what team members are coming available in the next, you know, three to six months. Um, again, we, we don't hire ahead of sales. We let sales kind of drive our, our hiring. And so we all always are looking at kind of the staffing plan to say, all right, we've got a team of four people, five people that are coming available four months from now. We know what their skill sets are. We know what projects they've worked on. Um, and can we create some content out of that that we can push into a channel that will help lead to opportunities for that team that's coming available in a few months? That was so, long-winded. Um, <laughs> One thing that I want to learn more about um, when you you mentioned about your nurturing program, where you and one other partner who does who takes care of the top of the funnel leads and making and building all these connections, you said you join these local networks and group of people. Like, how much time do you usually spend in? within those networks? Because I must imagine this question comes to many agency owners because they, you know, when they think about their own productivity or the way they are spending time, the time being spent on these networks where you are just building connections, do you, like, what, what percentage of time do you usually spend there? That's a good question. Um... I don't really track it. Um, I would say it, it falls into two buckets, right? So the first bucket is like my active kind of attention to that network, right? Um, and I would say that's probably no more than a couple of hours a week, um, honestly. Because I think you can get a lot of bang for your buck if you're just giving people a little bit of attention um, here and there, um, and you're not being pushy, right? So, I if this is not scientific, but in my mind, I kind of have this this concept of like spheres, right? Like there's the really close people, or those people that I want to I want to stay in touch with, you know, every week at least once a month, right? And then it kind of balloons out to here's the folks that. I need to talk to maybe once a quarter. And then on the outside, it's like, I just need to ping this person once a year. Um, and I don't really have like a, a spreadsheet or anything that I manage that through, but I just kind of in my head have that, that concept. And so, you know, in, in terms of like keeping in touch with our network of sister companies that help, you know, we all help kind of fill each other's, you know, gaps in terms of utilization, that's pretty frequent. I would say there's at least a couple of Slack exchanges a week with various companies in that group. Um, if you go out one layer, I would say, you know, again, maybe a couple of hours a month where I'm just pinging somebody that, hey, I, I know this person, I haven't talked to them in a while. I'm just going to say, hey, how are you doing? And then on the outermost ring of that sphere, I do have kind of a list of folks that, you know, I probably haven't talked to in a year and I just want to say, Hey, how are you doing? Sometimes that falls around the holiday or the new year where it's just kind of a natural time to kind of reconnect. Um, but in terms of like my active kind of outreach to that group, it, it couldn't be more than a two or three hours a week. On the other side, once you send that messaging out um, or people just are doing the same thing, you know, in reaching out to you, I'd say I probably spend another two to three hours a week responding to people that are coming to me. Um, and they're either just nurturing their own network or they're responding to a message that I sent. And so there's certainly some amount of that, but if I had to add it all up five, six hours a week, probably. Yeah. Um, and, and it doesn't take much to keep that those connections warm. And, and I see the importance of that as well, because this is not something you can 
give it to anyone else. It's like owner to owner relationship, which your salesperson or senior business dev person cannot take. So it has to be you. So I always, when I do that, I always think, am I doing, am I, am I using the, making the best use of my time doing this? But then, uh, you know, who else would it be? Like, you know, that's where this, you know, the need for the sales kind of automatically goes away because sales cannot do that. Uh, it has to be you coming from the leadership. So I always used to wonder like, you know, how much time is enough or, or you know, most relevant. So I, I, will, thank you I, will, say, I will say though that um, one thing that I have tried to do over the last probably year and a half, two years, especially through the pandemic is not necessarily transfer those relationships to other people, but to involve other people in our organization in those conversations. Um, because if it ultimately is just me, that I create the bottleneck for the company's growth, right? And so, you know, finding ways to say, this is a relationship, I can introduce somebody to somebody else in our organization, they can carry on that conversation. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm picky sometimes about who that is, what context that those are. But I think there is an important um, moment where a founder, you know, those owner to owner conversations do, they hit a, a, a limit at some point. And so getting other people involved in those conversations, or, you know, sometimes it's, it's more, it's an owner to owner conversation, but the question is, hey, I'd really like to introduce your marketing person to my marketing person. Yeah. I really like to introduce your one of your account executives to one of mine because not because I want to sell anything, but I just think that they would have a positive interaction, right? Like I think they could probably help each other in some way. And that just those are just seeds that tend to be growing over time and will bear fruit, you know, down the road. That's a great point. And I think it's yeah. a it's a cultural piece too, in terms of fostering those relationships and learning outside of your own team and you know, outside of the networking benefit of it. It's teaching those relationships tend to be the one that you take for a long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, as I, for me, listening to you say, okay, you do five or six hours a week as a guesstimate. I, I, it's, it's about an hour a day, which isn't that much time. If you're planning for it, my, my always goal is, can I meet one new person a week? Or, yeah. You know, one new person a week and one person I haven't talked to for a while and re re-engage with them. And that can look like a different couple of different things you know, this conversation can count in those cases. So it's, you know, but it's, it's, uh, I, I love that approach in terms of just expanding that work network. People get to know you, you get to know them. You can be like, oh yeah, I remember I talked to this guy who was awesome, who did X, Y, and Z. Let's see if they might be a good fit for what our needs are. And I think the other piece of that is leaving the conversation saying, who do you know that you should introduce me to? Or who mm -hmm. do you know that I should know? Also, I found that to be, that's my other it's my other sneaky insider networking tip. That yeah, seems to be fruitful over the years. The the last networking tip that I have um, around that because I that I agree with is is always like you know can we I did well, I haven't done this in a very long time but when we first started out I did these things that I called four by four lunches where I knew somebody in my network and the the goal was we'd agree. We're both going to bring somebody else that the other person doesn't know. And we're going to have four people for lunch. And I do that maybe once a month um, or so. And it always, not always worked out in well, because sometimes, you know, the other person brings somebody. It's like, oh, I don't, this is not going to, this is not, <laughs> this is not working. But I'd say, well, more than 50% of the time, it, it, I either learned something, even if it wasn't a potential client down the road, I'd learn something, I'd meet somebody new, I'd practice my networking skills, I would just meet another interesting human being, um, you know, more often than not. And so that's something that I used to do. But that leads me to, I think my last networking point, which is, if somebody's really, and this is, this is, this sounds harsh, but if somebody really isn't valuable, don't just move, move on. Um, there are people out there that end up really just being time thieves and you spend oh God, a lot yes. of time that 
is just not valuable. Um, and I think as you kind of progress through your career, you, you build this sixth sense of like, oh, I've met this person and they're a nice human being, but in the context of business, they're not going to be helpful to me, and but they're going to keep wanting to take. And I need to move on to another relationship where there's both give and take. That is a, I, you, you said that and there's about three people who are lovely humans who come to mind. And I'm like, oh man, it's like, how do I, they're master for salespeople in terms of like, okay, let's set up another time to chat when you leave the phone call. And you're like, yeah, I don't really want to because <laughs> I see no value in you from a business. Again, lovely, lovely humans. Like let's go out for a beer or coffee or whatever. But it's like, how do you, how do you weasel the way out of that? I don't know if that's the nicest way to say, how, you know, it's how do you navigate it out depends. of those? Like, do you have any tips? Yeah, it depends on the, at least in my experience and that, you know, others will have probably more insight into this than I will, but I've gone the route of just being direct um, on occasion and just saying, Hey, I just, you know, I've loved our conversations, but I really don't think there's a business opportunity here for us. Um, if in the future you think there is, and you can bring me, you know, an, an actual need, or if there's a, a you know, a, a real way that I can help you that isn't you just trying to sell me something, then we can talk again. But you know, for now, this is probably not the right. This just isn't the right fit, and I've got lots of other things to do, and I'm sure you do as well. So I've gone that route and. Again, you kind of have to feel out if the person is going to receive that well or not. I think a, a, a uh, I think that can work, right? You've got to read the room. You've got to read the personality, Agreed. but I think that can work. You know, the, the other way I've done it is redirect them to someone else, not necessarily within tandem, but re literally redirect them somewhere else to say, hey, I think I've got somebody else in my network because it's kind of a not a great thing to do, I suppose, but like, I've got somebody else in my network that I think might be a better fit for, you know, whatever the situation might be um, and to redirect them. And I'm not going to lie. I will be completely honest. I, I have ghosted people too, where it's just like, I just cannot respond to this email anymore, right? Like you've reached out to me 15 times, you're not getting the hints and I'm just going to mute this because, it, you know, if, if it's not a good fit for both parties, then we're both wasting each other's time, right? Like that person could yeah. find better opportunities somewhere else. Um, and, and that's honestly, that's the same. We, I, I try to apply that same thinking to, you know, hiring and firing, right? If somebody is at the company and isn't the right fit for tandem, for our clients, for our values, for the way that we want to work, we're both doing each other a disservice by not, disengaging from that relationship, right? It, it, every, every party is being harmed in some way there. And the, the kindest thing to do is actually to disengage. Um, and with hiring, you know, when we, we get tons of candidates that come through our hiring pipeline where you have an initial conversation and it's like, yes, this is a perfectly lovely human being. And if it's, this was a very different company, I'd love to work with this person, but not here because they're, we're just both uh, misaligned in some way. And it doesn't make sense to, to continue to engage. So again, long-winded answer, but like sometimes it's oh, just it's not good. a right fit. You know, it's, it's uh, I've done the same thing. And a lot of times too, for me, it's uh, honesty is the best policy. Hey, look, you're awesome. I'm awesome. We're awesome, but this isn't the right fit for me at the moment. You know, let me know. Keys, keep my email handy. Um, mm -hmm. I, and uh, give me a call. Uh, give me an email if something else crops up, but you, yep. you brought up hiring. Um, I, I want to tap into that for, for a second here too, because I think this is very applicable to that as well. And you guys do something kind of interesting at tandem. Do you want to, with, with how you hire and your transparency there, which I have not, we're seeing more of these days, but it's not totally mainstream yet. I want to give a little rundown of what you guys do. That's so cool. Yeah. So um, about two and a half years ago, we really kind of, maybe even three years ago at this point, we kind of hit a, a moment where we had a lot of open positions and we had job descriptions out there, but they weren't really very consistent. You know, you could... 
you could tell like various people in the organization had written different job descriptions, right? And it was just like, this is just for a candidate as you're going through this set of job descriptions and trying to figure out like, what should I apply for? It was very disjointed. And so we made the decision to create, you know, defined career paths for engineering and design. And in the future, we'll, we'll create additional ones for product management and other, other roles that, you know, might pop up. Um, and so we spent, you know, several months canvassing our own team, looking at back at candidates that had applied, um, scouring job descriptions of other companies that we respected, um, and put together, you know, a seven layer career path that's really clear on, you know, at each level, like what are you responsible for? Um, what consulting abilities do you need to demonstrate? Um, what is your sphere of influence on the company? Um, and it's created a really, uh, it's solved a lot of problems, both internally and in our hiring. Um, managers now have a very clear way to communicate to one of their reports, like, this is the thing, the set of things that you need to demonstrate in order to get to the next level. And it also gives the manager the, the kind of insight to say, well, here are the opportunities that I need to create for this person so that they can demonstrate those skills. And on the hiring side, it's very clear when a candidate comes in, you know, hopefully if they're reviewing those things and looking at them, it's very clear for them to say, well, I'd really like to apply for a senior level position, but at this company, given this career path, you know, SE3 or SE2 is really where I need to position myself. And for a hiring manager, when you're reviewing applications, you can also look back at that and benchmark to say, yeah, you applied for this position, but we really feel like this is more where you're at in our career paths. Um, so it solved a lot of the problems, both internally and on the hiring front. And then um, a little over a year ago, maybe, yeah, it's been a while, maybe two years ago almost now. Boy, time flies. Um, we made the decision to publish our salary bands. So along with the career path, there's a, a, a pretty narrow band for each level um, that a candidate can look at and say, hey, if I'm applying for this job and this isn't the salary that I need or... I want, then I can move on. Or I know when I'm getting into the conversation around a hire, this is like my band for negotiation. That's And that's it. And we are extremely hard line about that. We don't break that at all. If a candidate comes in at one level and is asking for a salary that's way outside of their band, it's just an easy conversation to say, this is the salary band at tandem for this role. And if that doesn't fit your requirements, then this probably isn't going to work. Um, we review those salary bands uh, every other year. Um, we've got data from a few different sources as was well going out to you know our network of sister companies and just kind of benchmarking. Are we all sort of in the same kind of range? So every two years we adjust those bands. We just did that um, mid year last year. Um, we also do a um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion study on our um, both historically and our current uh, team members in terms of their salary and compensation to make sure that um, you know we're being equitable across the the board. Uh, we share those reports internally to the team. Um, I'm very happy to say that um, there is almost no variance um, in gender. Um, uh, parental status, um, marital status, et cetera. Um, we're, we're, we keep that margin almost zero. Um, so that's kind of like how we think about hiring and compensation. Um, and I would encourage any company to do it. It's a little scary to put your salary bands out there because, you know, your initial thought as an owner is, well, you know, I'm going to exclude a bunch of people who I who might be really great hires um, because they feel like they're going to be outside of these bands. And we've actually found the opposite. Um, people come into that feeling a lot more free to have conversations in, in the hiring process and interview process that they might not have had if they felt like 
they had to get thrown into a negotiation. When you take that, that negotiating piece out of it, and now you can just focus on, are we both a good fit, right? Do I want to work for this company? Does this company want to work with me? And you can get down into those conversations when you remove the compensation element a bit. So it's been very positive for us overall. Um, so great, great share there. I mean, I think this is very unique uh, in, in many ways. Um, we tried that model in our firm having the band, but I think we just like you said, it could be very hard. And it was hard when we saw that some people are, you know, very, very important for us. We want to keep them. And they are by no means would be, you know, would, would be willing to stay in that band. Um, in those cases, it was not easy for us to, you know, keep or, you know, or let them go. I mean, how do you decide? Because they are such an important uh, a resource for you at that point for that project for that client you just cannot let them go so um it was challenging i i, I don't know i mean it, it seems like you guys have had similar experiences but you still uh stayed there you did not um you know change your policies and it was it still worked um apparently yeah i you know i think whether you have salary bans or not, you're always going to run into situations where um, I think certainly in our current state of the world, right, companies are going to come along and offer just insane amounts of money, right? And so whether you have a salary band or not, it's like, I can't pay you $80,000 more than I'm paying you now, right? And so if you want to go work for Google and they're offering you that, go do it. Like I would do it if I was 25, go do that. Right. Like, uh, you know, so you're always going to have that situation. Um, you know, we try not to have team members that get, um, so like, so entrenched with one customer that losing that person would make the account like in jeopardy. It would put the account in jeopardy, right? Like we we generally don't do that. Um, and we rotate people, you know, somewhat frequently. Um, we generally don't like folks to sit on projects for, you know, eight, 10, 12 months. Um, you know, we, we want, and that's good for tandem and good for the customer, right? Customer doesn't always think that, but in reality, it is good for them. They get new ideas. They their processes around onboarding get challenged and exercised. Um, you know their philosophy on you know how they run projects gets uh, you know a, a bump in in terms of new thinking and new um, you know the whole machine kind of gets rattled a little bit, which is not a bad thing, right? It gets it makes it more stable over the long term for there to be some amount of turnover. Um, so again, we try not to get folks that are, you know, pinned to a client where, hey, if this person leaves tandem, this is going to be a nightmare for this customer. Um, we do a ton of documentation um, to facilitate that. So as much as you know, writing code and um, creating user experiences and, and the design artifacts is part of like the day-to-day -day work, um, making sure that there's really solid documentation on every project so that when somebody does new comes in, they're not like starting from scratch. They've got like historic context. Um, we generally don't do turnover where an entire team gets pulled and moved to something else. So there's, there's always some kind of like layering of people as they come and go through a project. So there's good knowledge transfer. Um, and our philosophy on the, the salary bands is that, you know, we're not at 100% of, of market. We're not below 50% of market. We try to hit in that kind of 70 to 80% of market, but market for us includes product companies. They're just throwing silly money um, at engineers and designers right now. 
Um, the other way that we compete there is on, you know, other benefits. Um, you know, we, we have a really strong 40 hour only work week policy. We never ask people to do overtime. Um, we've got a generous PTO policy and we cover a hundred percent of the premiums for medical, dental, vision, short-term disability, long-term disability, you know, all of the things. Um, and so we, we, we also compete on those ancillary benefits that sometimes larger companies will offer, you know, a bigger salary, but they're really skimping on the benefits. And we kind of try to shift that a little bit the other way. It's, uh, it's finding the person who understands the value of not just the money. You know, there's a couple of ways I could have phrased that, but, you know, money is one thing, but it comes with like the challenges, the growth potential, the exposure to different clients, the ability to work on different clients, the flexibility in life. You know, it's, uh, I feel like that's something that people finding the right fit for your team who understands that is probably a big, big benefit there. It's, it's interesting as you were talking about uh, making salaries public, you think about clients that you, you pitch in some ways, a lot of the questions that we ask are what's your budget. So in this case, when you're hiring, we don't, there's legal implications of asking, Hey, what's your budget? You know, you have to ask that within certain parameters from an HR perspective. And it, it's, it occurred to me, I was like, why don't we do that? Cause it makes the negotiation different. It, you're evaluating whether or not. And I think that's something a lot of us have learned coming out on the other side of the pandemic is what do you want to be doing? How do you want to be spending your time and what feels good in making those decisions about the job and the roles that you do and that you take? Um, and that should be where, and allowing you to, to, to understand the candidate versus, and the candidate to ask, you know, when we were all, we're all of a certain age, I will say it when we were all a little bit younger, you never asked about company culture. Like it was shocking mm. to me, you know, five or six years ago when I was interviewing some junior people and they were like, well, tell me about the company culture. I'm like, well, why does it matter? I'm like, oh my God, of course it matters. <laughs> Young people, you know, and now it's like, if you don't ask, it's like, what's wrong with you? Are, are you weird? Like, why do you not care about this? Yep. So it's, it's like such an, and I think it's a healthy shift in the way that we do hiring mm -hmm. too. So, yeah, I have kind of a rubric that I try to use um, that I think fits tandem and probably fits a number of consulting companies. And I, I call it the Eric is the acronym for it. And it's, it's, uh, you know, empathy, resilience, improvisation, creativity, and kindness. And those are the things that I'm looking for when I'm trying to hire somebody, um, you know, can they, you know, put themselves in somebody else's shoes um, when they get knocked down, do they run for the Hills or do they get back up? You know, when something gets thrown at them, that is unexpected, can they improvise in the moment? Can they think on their feet? Um, are they creative in a way that breaks the mold for a client that actually needs that mold to be broken. And ultimately, can they do all of that with kindness towards their teammates, their clients, et cetera? Um, so that's kind of my rubric when I'm, you know, doing initial phone screens. I'm kind of poking at those things a little bit to try and tease out, you know, does this person seem that they will work well with tandem and work well with our customers? So yeah. we've talked about Oh, do you want, uh, you want me to go? You want me to go? go ahead. <laughs> the question asking shuffle. So um, we've talked a little bit about your uh, philosophy in sales and marketing and running an agency. We've talked a lot about hiring and staffing and cultural building within an agency. Out of all of the things that you do as an agency owner, what is the best part of running a business? Do you think? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. That's a good huh? one. That's a tough one. Um, it's not, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's probably twofold. It's seeing, not even actually, it's seeing one of our teammates have a light bulb moment with a customer. And it's not necessarily a coding light bulb moment or a design light bulb moment. It's a, oh, wow, I've kind of moved from one level of like 
understanding how to be effective here. And I've jumped to that next kind of level. So it could be as simple as I wrote this email a little bit differently than I would have yesterday. And it was so much more effective at getting through to the customer. Or it could be, you know, hey, we've been struggling for weeks to, you know, get access to some internal client system. And we just changed the way that we asked the question or we redirected it to somebody else. And suddenly the door opens and everything kind of becomes easier all of a sudden. So it's that, it's those kind of moments that I feel like are really satisfying for me when I can see our team learn how to do that and continually be more, more effective. Um, and yeah, that translates to value on the client side, but the, the, the joy element of it for me is when I can see those moments happen for individuals and, and teams that, um, that we've got deployed. And you thinking about that even shows, you know, the kind of leadership that you guys have. If you have that thought, right, that, you know, this is what gives me joy, that is what gives me happiness, that means you must be doing something towards that to help your people succeed and do better and learn, uh, which makes you happiness, uh, which make you happy. So that I think eventually comes from the leadership. You can give all the credit to the client, how much ever you want, but ultimately it's you that is driving that type of culture in the team. So that's a, that's a great point. Um, how, how, do you, how did you get into this role? I want to learn more about like little history <laughs> and like how, how did it all start? Yeah, um, depends on how far you want to go back. <laughs> um, I mean, Tandem started, uh, we actually were called DevMind way back in the day when we, when we first launched. Um, we can talk about rebranding at some point if you want, because that was a fun adventure. Um, but, you know, the company started, I was working for a smaller consulting company in, in Chicago called Obtiva. Um, and I was at Groupon as a consultant. So I spent a little over a year. Um, this is back in the Groupon, like, heyday when it was, it was the thing, it was the it in Chicago startup community. And they had deployed well over 50% of their consultants to Groupon, which is not a great place to be in as a consultancy owner. Um, and ultimately ended up, got it, everybody got hauled into Tan or Optiva's office on a Thursday afternoon. And the message was Monday morning, you're going to be Groupon employees um, because we've been acquired. And I was one of just a couple of folks that just was like, you know, I don't really want to be selling discount spa services and, you know, cheap restaurant tickets. Like that's just not what I want to spend my time doing um, or facilitating. And so, you know, I, I kind of just said, I'm going to, we're going to launch out and do our own thing. I had a co-founder at the time, somebody that I knew from a previous employer. Um, and we really just started we took a couple of clients from Optiva and a couple of other clients that we had known from our previous, you know, consulting histories and just started doing staff augmentation ourselves. Um, and pretty quickly that snowballed into clients asking for more and more um, folks. And so we started hiring and, you know, back then it was very much like, we're just making up a business by the seat of our pants. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I've, what is QuickBooks? You know, like just, had no idea what we were doing, um, but we we knew how to do the work. And I think for a lot of companies like ours, the the owner founder that can also do the work has a huge advantage um, because they understand they understand the client relationship. I think a lot more clearly than uh, a founder that's kind of coming out of a different industry and doesn't understand the they don't understand the the things that developers and designers care about, they don't really understand the, the way to deliver, you know, quality services to a client with clarity. Um, and so, you know, I think we had an advantage there. Um, and then, you know, 
as we started to get, grow a little bit more, um, I think when we hit the sort of 20 person mark, um, you know, my co-founder had, had exited and I was really thinking about like, you know, is this staff augmentation thing, the thing that we really want to be doing? Um, is there's nothing wrong with staff augmentation, but I think for us, it, it took away some of the influence with the client. It was very much order taker, right? I'm just pulling tickets out of JIRA and coding something up. Um, and that's when we started to make the shift um, to focus more holistically on our offerings, um, building a design practice, a really strong UX practice, research practice, um, growing out a team of um, client partners who can help facilitate a client's needs a little bit more uh, at the account level and not so much just you know, shuffling SOWs back and forth. Um, and that eventually led us to the rebrand, which was, you know, DevMind was very engineering focused, very staff aug focused back in the day. And at a certain point, we looked so different from that, that initial company that we said we need to re, we need to rebrand. We need we need a new identity. Um, and that that started a many months long process of getting to a new name, a new brand identity. Um, that you you would see online today, um, and in a I think a much clearer message to our clients around what the value proposition um, we can offer, you know what that so looks like. In the spirit of networking and fun moments, can you tell this? You know where I'm headed with this question. Can you tell Maybe. the story? <laughs> well, so you know, prior to our call, you weren't always in the agency world, if I'm not mistaken, That's, you have a, a degree in something else. So yeah. since we've talked a lot about networking, there's always, you know, you always remember one or two fun facts about somebody. I'm totally going to bait you into answering this one. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, as, as we wrap things up here in a minute, but can you tell the story of where you started to get into that, to that world? Yeah. So I was a music major. Um, I studied piano performance, um, was a, uh, this is 96, 97, tiny liberal arts school in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, grew up playing the piano and I really just couldn't think of a major that I wanted other than that, even though I knew going into it, like, this is probably not going to end up being a career because you either have to teach or you have to perform. And I probably wasn't good enough to perform and really didn't like teaching. Uh, so junior year, I think, um, my sweet mates were a business major and a computer science major. So it was the three of us. None of us had anything in common whatsoever, except we really liked fits fuddling with, you know, early games, right? Um, PC games. And this was in the days in this particular part of the world, like, the campus really hadn't even been wired for internet yet. So everybody on campus of 5,000 students or whatever, small school, were dialing up to a local ISP. And one night um, we were trying to get, I think it was a Quake server online. To, we had some people over in the room. We were all trying to play you know, Quake together. And we just we're banging our heads because we just could not get a stable internet connection. And this was probably two o'clock in the morning. And I remembered there was a business card that got left in everybody's room. That was the number for this local ISP. And I had it in my desk drawer and I pulled it out and I said, I'm going to call this just because it says 24 hour customer service on it. So I called it and a guy picked up and it was very clear that I had woken him up out of bed. Like he didn't really even realize he was answering like the business line. And it was, you know, in hindsight, like this was somebody that was running an ISP out of his basement. Right. And he probably the campus was like his major client source. And he just laid into me like nobody has ever in history. And so, you know, I relayed all, I hung up the phone and I relayed all this and business major roommate said, we should put that guy out of business. And again, this is late at night and we're all kind of 
out of it a little bit. Computer science guy said, yeah, I think maybe we could do that. And I'm like, I don't know anything about this, but what the hell? So lo and behold, like a month or two later, we had raised some money from friends and family. We rented an office in the next little town over. We had a MCI back in the day, brought a T1 online in. We had some 3Com modems and we started MC. offering internet access. Um, and our thing was we wanted to beat him on customer service. And we said, 24 hours a day, we will help you get online. And again, this is this is like Windows 311 days um, where it was not super easy to get online. We got some very expensive pagers. <laughs> we did 24 hour rotation. So each of us would take a shift and any hour of the day, if somebody called, we would drive out to your house with a floppy disk and help you get online. Wow. And okay. ultimately we, we, we ended up putting Jordan internet out of business. Um, and this was right at the right moment because cable was just starting to be a thing and the, the campus was starting to get wired for internet. And we ended up, you know, through that business, having lots of local companies that were just trying to figure out how do I build my first website? Um, I knew nothing about this, but for whatever reason, I volunteered to say, I'll figure it out and help. So I, you know, went to Barnes and Noble and I got as many books on HTML and whatever was the server side language of the day um, and figured out how to do it. And we built a bunch of, you know, websites, database backed websites back in the day, you know, online quote storefronts. Um, and we ended up selling the business to a, a regional ISP that was bringing cable into the, to the area. And that's kind of how I got started. Um, and then when I, you know, left school, um, came home for a couple of years, got a, a job with a small consulting company in Charlotte, North Carolina, and really just enjoyed the the consulting world and just stayed there ever since. Is college education worth every penny? <laughs> yes. I, I say that as a, as a former <laughs> studio art major myself. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> No, but sculpture, because that's oh, nice. an interesting, useful entity. But let me let me ask you one last question as we wrap things up here. We've, I think Varun and I have both really enjoyed chatting with you uh, today. Some really good insights and topics we haven't touched on with fellow agency owners. But let me ask you, what what's exciting you about the future? What are you looking forward to? Well, I mean, I can't not... Uh mention like I'm really looking forward to getting out of the pandemic and getting back to the office to a certain extent. I mean, we've, we moved to a remote model, um, we closed our office here in Wabanzia, which had way too much space and moved downtown. So we're in the Lyric Opera building now, but um, looking forward to just getting back in the room around a whiteboard with people. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, on the flip side of that, I'm really looking forward to the ways that remote work has opened us up to new team members that we would never have met before. Um, you know, I think we've got people in nine or 10 states now um, and folks that just, you know, we never would have met because we were only hiring in Chicago and San Francisco. Um, looking forward to, you know, growth. Um, we're projecting around 15 to 20% growth um, for this year. And that's gonna create some new challenges for us in terms of our leadership team right now is kind of hitting the ceiling where we're gonna have to start breaking into a different leadership structure in order to support growth. So those are some challenges that I'm, you know, they're challenges, but I'm looking forward to, to tackling them. Um, yeah, that's what's on the horizon for us more complex problem solving in fun and interesting ways. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. For, for those of you listening, you can find JC um, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, and on madeintandem.com. Um, and all of your, your socials are linked off the bottom of that site too. So thank you so much. If you yeah, learned thank you. something, th yeah, thank you. And thank you, Varun. I've, I've, 
per usual. Um, that's it, everyone. If you've learned something today or laugh, tell somebody about the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.